Welcome back to The Nerdy Pastor. It has been a while, everybody, and I've got to get caught up in some things. And it's the perfect time uh, to get caught up because um, I'm moving. This is also the reason why I've been truant for a number of weeks on posting anything, and I am really behind on getting into my deep dive series uh, that I've been wanting to do for some time now. And so I'm going to do my best today with getting to some Charles Hodge. And Charles Hodge, as you can see here, uh, the first volume, so I'm not doing all three, just the first volume here, which focuses on theology proper. And in this deep dive series, my, my goal is to go a little further, a little farther into the contents of the book to give some more evaluation of the book, not just a general overview, though that's included, um, and to talk a little bit about the history of, of the book and the theology itself and its receptivity and those things, and just what it says, go a little deeper into the book and try to understand the usefulness of the text and the theologian, and um, this, is a, this is a good one, y'all. Um, so Charles Hodge, and I've got actually just bought his collection of essays, um, that, that was published way back when as well, but republished by Baker a number of years ago, I think back in the 90s, uh, on what is Darwinism. There's the picture of uh, Charles Darwin with this grandiose beard there. And he has a collection of essays that were very anti-Darwinianism. And, and for Hodge, um, Darwin and Darwinianism essentially was atheism, is, is what it is. Though it's interesting, what we'll see in his, his theology proper is that he does make space for there to be some sense of a possibility of, of theistic, um, potential theistic evolution. He doesn't teach it per se, but there's kind of this cautiousness or something. Now, I'm not saying I hold to that, but simply Charles Hodge is saying this might not be the worst thing in the world is kind of what he's saying um, in, in kind of passing. He doesn't really develop it at all uh, or very much. He just simply says some things in passing. I'll read them to you. Um, so he's he's very anti-Darwin and the, the, the theories, as he calls them, because they are the Darwinian theories of origin um, and, and kind of rank and file atheism, basically. But he does open himself up to the possibility of some kind of process in creation and that. So that's just something to tuck away and to kind of know about Charles Hodge. Charles Hodge is, is a, a timeline of 1797 to 1878. So he is really you know, the, the large part of the 19th century and his interlocutors, who he's really going against, um, there, there's a number, but when you read through this volume, you will see it's two or three specifically. The first is, it's important to know, that at the time of his writing, this systematic theology, three volumes, 1870 to 1873 or 1871 to 1873, this is right after the completion of Vatican one, the first, you know, global ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church since those three series of councils in Trent in the mid to, you know, third quarter of the 16th century. So huge, massive, important thing where they essentially confirm and, and crystallize in their dogma, you know, Immaculate Conception of Mary, um, Pope speaking ex cathedra, the Pope is the Vicar of Christ. Uh, he's not just the head of the church. He can speak ex cathedra and, and many other other kind of well-known now Roman Catholic doctrines getting kind of rubber stamped at Vatican I. This influences how Charles Hodge writes his Systematic Theology, Volume 1, because it has a lot to do with his time period of what he's responding to. So what's great about this volume and, and the contents, before I say what's great, the contents of this volume, are there are six chapters of kind of a prolegomena, you know, intro to systematic theology. How do we do theology? So the prolegomena includes two kind of sections. The first is epistemology. How do we know something? How do we know what we know? The second part has to do specifically with authority and inspiration, and it's speaking specifically to the Roman Catholic Church in Vatican I. Pope is the vicar speaking ex cathedra in the place of Christ on earth. Um, and he speaks to the Protestant rule of faith, the analogy of faith, sola scriptura. These things are in the prolegomena in six chapters. And then right after that, he goes into uh, proper theology, okay? And that's going to include uh, 13 chapters. And this is essentially how he, he goes into theism. He goes into contrary views to theism, okay? There's four specific he touches on. Um, 
I think, uh, I think he talks specifically um, also on the, the uh, Trinity right after that. And then he gets himself into the divinity of Christ, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Then he moves his way into the uh, creation, providence, miracles, and angels. So this is traditional um, theology proper. The, the theism, the attributes of who God is um, or what God is, is, is the more proper way of saying it. So in many ways, he's working his way through. There's, a, there's kind of a, a loose affiliation, a looser affiliation maybe with the Westminster Confession of Faith in its ordering here. As you can see right here, he's basically following that outline in a way. Um, but, you know, Robert Louis Dabney, another uh, famous Southern Presbyterian, or sorry, another famous Presbyterian, but the Southern Presbyterian, whereas Hodge is the Northern Presbyterian. Dabney actually 33 lectures on the 33 chapters of the Westminster Confession of Faith. So Dabney sticks a little closer in his outline and his systematic theology. Hodge is a little bit more broad and verbose. Hodge comes in at about 2,500 pages in his volume. Whereas I can't remember, can't remember Dabney's. I think Dabney's is about 370. And I, I, I mentioned Dabney because he's writing at about the same time. So is uh, 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 Breckenridge, uh, Robert Breckenridge, another well-known Southern Presbyterian who came out with his um, objective and subjective revelation, a two-volume systematic theology that kind of focuses on this idea of um, external and internal revelation, objective and subjective revelation. Um, and, and he kind of gets criticized by Dabney and Hodge uh, for that kind of organizational uh, method, um, though I still kind of find it, you know, um, interesting. And uh, it might not be the best way of going about it, but it's it's interesting seeing some creativity with it. Um, but Hodge's is going along the lines of more of a traditional um, scholastic method, but also taking cues from the Westminster Confession of Faith. And his volume is spectacular. Um, you know, if you don't have it, first of all, and you're a minister, you need to get it. it you need to read it and you get it, read it. It's super, super cheap. It's, it's published by Hendrickson and you can buy it for, you know, as little as 30 or $40 these days, which is incredible um, because there's so many that were published and maybe not sold. Um, I think at the highest I've ever seen it is $75 for the three volumes. So it's really cheap and affordable. So it, it's a spectacular systematic theology for a number of reasons. There's a few drawbacks, and I'll mention those at the very end. But I'll give you kind of the, the basis of why I think this is a fantastic systematic theology. First, is because it follows a scholastic method. It has a confessional kind of grounding in the Westminster Confession. But yet, it is very kind of moderate it, it's broad in the way that it, it, it uh, attacks the subjects. Um, it's moderate in its, its Calvinism. What I mean by that is um, it's not going to try to filter everything through that lens, though it's highly Calvinistic, especially volume two, as we get further along to the doctrines of grace and those things. But, but the focus is, is obviously in theology proper, very you know, Catholic, small c. Um, um, there's a broad engagement um, with the church um, in um, in this opening volume, especially as it comes to the knowledge of God um, and the attributes of God. So some really good things there. Um, it's pretty historical. He, he kind of brushes broadly over historical theology, but he doesn't leave it out. So he does broad strokes over historical theology. But if, if I have to define uh, Charles Hodges' kind of mode of oper operation, his MO, for his volume one, it's going to be philosophical, theological, biblical, historical. So philosophical and theological, and then biblical and historical. He, he really leads more with philosophical, theological kind of method. And yes, it's very much backed up by scripture and it's very much backed up, backed up by kind of, here's how the tradition of, of historical theology has worked. But he really leans more into philosophical, historical theology, which is um, kind of part of that Princetonian and also Southern Presbyterian uh, tradition. Um, so again, there, there sometimes can be a weakness there, but sometimes there's a strength there too. It just depends on kind of you know which theologian you're talking to. I think Hodge is a little bit better on leaning a little bit more towards the biblical historical than maybe Dabney, who kind of at times leans a little too far into I think the rational approach to theology. Though he's not a rationalist by any stretch, neither is Hodge. But there's just kind of a sometimes a dependency there. But Hodge a little less so than Dabney which is interesting, Hodge has this great uh, comment in the opening prolegomena that God is not a conclusion of your mind. It's just a powerful statement to think about. We don't reason our way to God, is what he's trying to say. 
So against Thomas Aquinas, against, you know, the, the Enlightenment, um, which doesn't believe that, but basically thinks, you know, there's some capacity in humans to kind of reason to a certain degree to God. He's like, God is not a conclusion of your reasonable mind or your reasoning powers. Um, that's just really important to understand. So he's not a rationalist. There are rationalistic elements to his theology. That's why I call him a philosophical, theological theologian here. But he's not a, a rationalist by any stretch. He really defines what that is and kind of knocks that over in the in the prolegomena specifically. Um, and he also engages throughout kind of against rationalism that essentially believes that you can kind of just reason your way to God being a conclusion of your brain, of your mind, of your intellect. Um, however, he has this one fascinating quote early on in the prolegomena. And after he gives this index, this version gives you the index of the entire three volume up front. So you can look up all the key words and then it gets to the prolegomena and then it goes on to the theology proper. But really there's a fascinating quote. I, I'm going to read this one to you. He talks about the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So he's following here the tradition of Augustine all the way through Calvin. I think it's capstoned with Calvin. It's kind of cornerstoned, at least in the, the history of theology with, with St. Augustine, the inner teaching, the inward teaching of the Holy Spirit. He says this, although the inward teaching, this is page 16, of the spirit or religious experience is no substitute for an external revelation and is no part of the rule of faith. So he's not a Quaker. He's not a mystic. So the, the rule of faith is not governed by inner experience or the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. But then, then he qualifies it and he says this, it is nevertheless an invaluable guide in determining what the rule of faith teaches. So there's a qualifier that's powerful there. The distinguished feature of Augustinianism all the way through Calvin, the reformers, the great Geneva divines. So you're going to think Beza, you know, there as well. And, and others that follow after Calvin, you know, and, you know, Knox was in Geneva for a little while. And you, you think of, um, uh, uh, many others, Knox called Geneva the, the greatest school of Christ the world's ever seen, you know. So he's he's drawing from them. He says, uh, the distinguishing feature of Augustinianism all the way through Calvin and the Geneva divines is that the inward teaching of the Spirit is allowed its proper place in determining our theology. The question is not first and foremost, what is true to our understanding? Here it is. But what is true to the renewed heart? Wow. So all this stuff about knowing God and how we know God, and it's not rationalism, it's not mysticism, it's it's the the the, the understanding that God's given us that we are we are responsible to know God, um, you know, because God's spoken to us, so we have a responsibility, you know, responsibility to God because He's spoken to us. Yet He's spoken to us in reasonable, not irrational ways. They're believable. But they're not inexhaustible. We can't understand them completely. But then he qualifies all of that after like, you know, 15 pages of explaining knowledge. And he says, but ultimately what is true is the understanding of the heart. And this is what is given a proper place to the rule of faith. So the rule of faith has to be testified to. It has to be given evidence to. It has to be rubber stamped per se by the inward witness, the renewed heart of a believer who knows that they love God, a knowledge that's relational, not simply cognitive. This is really guiding Hodge in many ways in the way that he understands theology. It's a, it's, it's a, it's very mentally absorbing in a way, but it, it's fortified with the proper place of the heart knowledge of knowing what is true through the renewed heart. Um, I think that's a really strength of his. And you'll see that less so in the first volume. You'll see that more often in the next two volumes. But it still, it still pops up in volume one. Another strength, I think, of, of Hodge is that he is highly, and this again, I, I quote Dabney here again, uh, bring Dabney in here because there's so much similarity to Dabney when it comes to how they, their methodology. It's highly apologetic. You'll see this also, and it's not on any of the, the, the shelves because they're, they're all gone. Uh, they're, in, uh, they're in boxes. Uh, but you'll see this with Douglas Kelly in his great three-volume uh, work that he just completed uh, this year. You'll see similar kind of methodology, philosophical, theological, highly apologetic. So always interlocking with those who disagree. I think Hodge is very ironic, meaning that he has a, a, a kindness and a gentleness in how he disagrees. 
He's also easier to follow than Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly's really dense, and he doesn't quite separate his apologetics quite as well, maybe, sometimes. He's always kind of in the middle of it, whereas Hodge, I think, does a really good job of organizing his apologetics. He typically states a definition of a, of a theological term or a theological movement or something key to his theology. He then gives some proofs of it. He then gives the, the interlocutors right after and then he responds at the very end. So you typically know where he is. I, I would say his volume on a scale of zero to ten, you know, you know, maybe one or two being um, something like, oh, I don't know, would be the like like concise theology by you know um, J.I. Packer. A ten being, oh goodness, Catherine Sonderager. If you if you've ever seen her volumes come, first two volumes of her three volume project come out, those are about a nine and a half. Those are very difficult uh, to read and to really comprehend. Um, Dr. Kelly's, Douglas Kelly's probably about a seven or eight up there. He's probably more than eight. I'd say Charles Hodge about a five. He, he is really not hard to read. I really would recommend him as a more introductory systematic theology for people because he really is a, a just an um, outstanding teacher. You're going to know where he's at in the subject material. So he has, I think, a very strong apologetic flavoring as you read through him. That's a strength. It's very, um, it's very easy to follow in the educational kind of mapping of, of his subject material. Uh, another strength, I think, another strength again is that he he really undergirds the strength of understanding in the mind with a a truth understood in a renewed heart. So he, he gives a proper place to the regeneration of the believer reading the text of Scripture and interpreting the text of Scripture. And the rule of faith is is not the inward witness, but it's given a, an, a strengthening, an evidential kind of perspective, um, uh, a collaborative place to theology. So that's really important, too, with Dr. Hodge also. Um, there's, there's other strengths too that I really enjoy. I, I think I really like his his um, area on the attributes of God. He does a good job there of not, uh, he doesn't go on and on and on and on. If I remember, it's like 50 pages long. Um, I'll open up real quickly here to, to see how long it is, but he does a good job not belaboring some points here and there. But yeah, on, on his uh, knowledge of God, um, that's only like 35 pages. And then on the attributes and nature of God, you know, it, that one's about, yeah, that one's almost 80 pages, and so that's a little longer. But, you know, the Trinity, he gives to about 40 pages. The Divinity of Christ, he gives about 40 pages. A uh, little quibble here that the Holy Spirit doesn't get a whole lot of attention here, about 28 pages. Um, so there are a few, there's a few drawbacks. I'll give a couple. Again, these are minor quibbles. Um, the first is the, the apologetic strength sometimes can be a little bit of a weakness. It doesn't, it doesn't lend itself quite as much as a constructive theology as an apologetic theology, I mean, you look at his anti-theism chapter um, in the theology proper, and he, he gives almost 100 pages to anti-theism theories. Again, I get it. it. It's important to define theism, anti-theism, and he has four areas to cover, you know, but only giving, you know, 20 something pages to the person and work of the Holy Spirit and giving almost 100 pages again, it's like 85 or 90 or something to anti-theism issues. You, you really want it to be more of a constructive model i think there than an apologetic model there's there is a place for apologetics but i think he might have given too much space to apologetics at least in volume one where i would like to have seen a little bit more um maybe on the divinity of christ and the person the work of the holy spirit would be good um another weakness again not 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 a it's quibble here but but you know he he this is a strength and a weakness. There, there's this great section where he commends the importance of science. And he talks, and again, this is from the very beginning of his book. And so there's, a, there's an openness to learning about the facts of nature and allowing those facts to inform how we interpret the Bible correctly. I think that's good. It's important. He brings up, of course, the famous you know, issue of thinking that, that the sun revolved around the earth for you know, 1,500 years. So, so we need to listen to the facts of science. Facts, not theories. Okay, so that's what he makes the key. So I think that's a strength there, but I'll, I'll get to the weakness in a second. But this is on page 573. He says, it is not with facts, but with theories, believers have to contend. So that's important. So, so notice when we say science, he's saying we need to be for scientific facts and contend with scientific theories. 
because typically those theories come against the scriptures. That's a really good point there. And then he says, many such theories have from time to time been presented apparently or really inconsistent with the Bible. Okay, But these theories have either proved to be false or to harmonize with the word of God when they're properly interpreted. So there's a positive relationship between science and scripture. This is good. This is positive. He says the church has been forced one, uh, more than one time to alter her interpretation of the Bible to accommodate the discoveries of science. Again, using Galileo and the sun revolving around the earth as an example. Now, this opens them up to uh, maybe some thoughts that might be, to me, this is my personal um, belief, a, a little far-fetched when it comes to um, creation. But again, he's not teaching here, at least, um, some kind of evolutionary theory, though he's seems to be open to it. Um, so a little drawback here, but this is on page 574. He says, it, so if it should be proved that the creation was a process continued through countless ages and that the Bible alone of all the books of antiquity recognize that fact, then the idea of the, of it, of the Bible being a human book or of human origin would become utterly incomprehensible. So again, notice he's not teaching some kind of strong evolutionary theory. He's actually rejecting Darwin really strongly in, in, in kind of um, putting that together with atheism. But there's a sense of, hey, if these periods of time in, in creation allow us to understand science and history better and are proven from facts, they only strengthen the Bible. They don't weaken the Bible. I would agree with that. They would strengthen the Bible if they're in fact facts, not theories. Okay. So there, there's a little bit of a potential weakness there, I think, on his uh, um, doctrine of creation there. But some really strong stuff in providence and things that follow angels and miracles. Love his stuff on miracles, how God, of course, immediately works on uh, uh, some, some person or, of course, in, in creation or in regeneration. These are the proper understandings of miracles that God immediately works instead of works through a second hand or a secondary agent, which then would not be immediate, it would be immediate. So there's some really just great stuff here. But again, a couple drawbacks is, you know, sometimes the apologetic nature of the book goes, I wouldn't say overboard, but it, it just is a little, there's just too much in one area concentrated. And sometimes it skimps a little bit on the doctrine of, I think, I'm not, not saying the divinity of Christ, it could have just been a little bit more, but definitely the doctrine of the Holy Spirit could have been further along. Um, and I think that that would have been balanced out a little bit more and less apologetic there and more constructive in the theology there. I, I do think it, it would be good, you know, as we're going through, you know, this book, for some people, again, as an intro, I still think it's a fairly intro level read, is it would be good to have more scriptural citations. I think that that's, well, if you've read the scriptures and you read this, you know it's scriptural. But it's just good to have scriptural citations, just like the Westminster Confession does. It doesn't just state facts, scriptural facts, and then, not back them up with proof text. I still think proof texting is a good thing when you're doing it, you know, wisely and um, responsibly. Um, and then lastly, th there is at times uh, an overemphasis on kind of rationality. And again, this is part of this tradition. And um, as much as I love Charles Hodge, there are some times where there seems to be some, some rationalistic tendencies, though I think he does a better job than most of saying, look, we need to be against, you know, true rationalism. So I just say there's rationalistic tendencies, and it, it might be what leads a little bit to the weakening of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit later on in the book and, and just skimping a little bit on that. However, the book is just magnificent. I, I really want to commend this book to y'all. It, it, it's fantastic. It's not hard to read. It's long. It's 650 pages, give or take, but it's not hard to read. You know, I took a reading group through the first number of chapters through the book, um, and, and most folks had a fairly easy time going through it and understanding it, not reading a whole lot of, you know, systematic theology in their lives. So this is not a really hard book. It's probably about a five, maybe a little bit lower than that on difficulty. It also is really strong on, I think, the doctrine of Scripture. And uh, something I should add there, it's really, really strong on the doctrine of Scripture, inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of revelation, uh, the inscripturation of of uh, uh, the writings of Scripture, you know, the the revelation of God inscripturated, and the inspired agents, the prophets and apostles, of course, Jesus um, um, as well, the, the the prophetic kind of apostolic tradition being inscripturated to the Bible, the inspiration, revelation, knowledge, and the and the 
um, the, the, the without error of, of truth that God inspires men and moves them along, as, as 2 Peter 1.20 says. He is really good on that. And, and I think should definitely read. Now, you know, Dr. Warfield is more known for that. Um, he writes more on it. Whereas I think Hodge is more concerned about the naturalistic tendencies of the world, materialism, specifically the mysticism in the church. He's more of an apologist, I think, for general, the unicity of God, knowledge of God, epistemology. Whereas Warfield definitely is focused more on the charismata and, and focusing on counterfeit miracles and talking more about the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures and, and talking more about it from that apologetic stance and that subject. But I think Hodge generally is... is um, really, really good on most stuff and easy to read, apologetic, and you're going to get a lot of good defense of the faith, um, inspiration and, and revelation of the knowledge of God. Super good on that. I think it's one of my favorite sections of his total and of most from most theologians, actually, it's one of my favorite sections on, on how we know God. It, it's really good. And I think he does a, a fantastic job on, on, on putting together the attributes of God, the unicity of God. I think that's a real strength of Dr. Hodge. And in fact, I think it's a strength that many theologians would be good to go back and reread him again on the, the oneness of God, the unicity of God. God is one. And then, then reading through the attributes of God and, and his defense of the moral attributes of God. And um, Catherine Sondrager, in her great book on uh, the doctrine of God, actually quotes Charles Hodge many, many, many times. Um, she actually contests with Charles Hodge a little bit on his reading of, of Dr. Schleimacher, um, you know, the father of modern liberal theology, uh, which is interesting. Uh, that's an interesting little side note to kind of go check out. Um, but she really uh, approves of Hodge in many places uh, quite a bit. And it's, it's great that she goes back and, and retrieves Charles Hodge uh, for modern systematic theology. So it shows uh, someone who's doing a hefty, hefty work in theology, pulling substantially from Charles Hodge. It shows the, the, the commendability of Charles Hodge in many areas of theology that we need to, we need to retrieve and reread. So read him, everybody. Really cheap books, very affordable um, I, I think he's got four or five areas that I commended that are just spectacular. There's a few quibbles, a few drawbacks, but a spectacular theologian in the Reformed Presbyterian, American Presbyterian vein through much of the 19th century, kind of a stalwart for, for many, many, many years at Princeton before it became a liberal seminary later on in the 20th century. A fantastic a theologian. His, his um, theology was used for decades uh, by pastors, and it's been told that he trained 8,000 pastors at the seminary. So, I mean, that just kind of shows you the, the, the reach that his theology has had, and it should continue to train pastors like myself, and hopefully you. All right, um, sign off for now.